What is good, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Hopefully you guys are all doing quite dandy uh, this morning, this afternoon, and whenever you're listening to this podcast. Uh, welcome once again to another episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm-Up Sessions podcast. And today's going to be a really fun and interesting topic that's a little controversial, a lot misleading, uh, just from the little bit of research that we were just doing literally right before the podcast. There's a lot of stuff on the internet that's don't believe everything you hear and you see on the internet. Don't you? You don't even have to believe us. Oh, that's Who right. says we're tr- yeah, we're saying exactly. the truth? We probably are, folks. <laughs> we're probably the best. I mean, one thing there. we know is we're not scientists. That's <laughs> yes, a given. exactly. Yeah. And hopefully someday we can have yeah. a scientist on the podcast. Oh, right. That would be fun. But we're gonna talk coffee processing, washed honey, natural anaerobic, triple thermal shock, upside down, lemon peel, mangoes, and all kinds of good stuff. Mm. So stay tuned for this episode, but before we jump right in there, let's pour some batchy, as always, getting a cup of of joe. I brewed a big dose. What'd you brew? 1,020 milliliter dose. Why? Or, I mean, that's not the yield. That was just the amount of water I poured into the tank. You know, extra extra coffee. Dude, what kind of fun mug is that? Yeah. It's the first time I'm seeing it. What is it? It's from David's Tea. I bought it in Canada, and Strange. well, I think I've mentioned this. I've broken Strange. four of the fellow mugs now. The or tasters, these, the tasters. Yeah. Um, so I gave up their a set is forty bucks. I don't know, they're yeah. way too expensive. These were forty dollars CAD. So they came out like each together. Two. Oh, two of them. Two. Of them. Yeah, they're fun. They're cute. Yeah, I like they're, it. Double eight ounce, uh, I think it's eight ounces. Nice. Eight ounce or six yeah. ounces. Yeah. That's so it's fun. made for tea. By David's tea. Nice. I like it. It's nice. That's excellent. Did I say 40? Sorry. They're 20. They're 20 for two. I was going to say that's kind of expensive. Yeah, 40 is with, I bought it with $32 with a bag of tea. Okay. That that makes a lot more sense. A little cool down. Ooh, getting some florals on there. A little bit of black tea. Some kind of, um, some kind. There's like a distinct floral in there. I don't. Uh, it's like a, not a lavender. Maybe like a rose, but maybe rose is too too complex mm-hmm. for it. I don't know. There's something something in there that's kind of interesting. I don't know. I think it's, this coffee is. <clears throat> it's just sweet. It's yeah. Not super complex. Like it, it's it's just sweet. Yeah. But, it's fine. Yeah. It's not anything enough. mind mind blowing, but. I probably choose it over most mm-hmm. coffees in the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I believe this is the Gogugu Bekaka. A Guji. Guji. Uh, it's a Guji that we had, but we no longer have. So this is actually a roaster from, we won't drop any names, but where is it from? Arizona. 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 So mm-hmm. coffee roaster from Arizona. Um, it's yeah. Fun. That's it. It's actually, a, a, actually extraction wise. This is a killer extraction. Yeah. The mouth feels nice. It, it it brewed just very nicely, not over, not under. Um, very pleasant mouth feel. Mouth feel. Like, mm-hmm. It works. Mm-hmm. Just I mean, the flavors are... <clears throat> I mean, honestly, I'd be, I would be pumped to walk into a cafe and just get this cup right here. <laughs> On Search, I don't know if I can take you seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I mean, God, it's, it no. ain't no Diego, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you walk in, you stroll into your friendly neighborhood cafe and you get this on batch. Cool. To your neighborhood friendly cafe. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I don't, I don't. Yeah. I'm pumped because friends, we're going to Portland soon, mm. Um, That's gonna be which is going to be fun. It's going to be, we got, we snagged a little Airbnb in downtown um, Whoa! Is it downtown? I, I mean, I, I mean, it's not. It's not downtown. Part of this process. Portland is kind of. Do- <laughs> you, said you were. No, don't was lie. I? Don't lie. I was somewhere this. in the room. <laughs> don't lie to the people. <laughs> no, I was somewhere in the room. Like, in the room I, I didn't look it. at. It's yeah, about that's it. about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, no, it's not in Portland. I mean, the cool thing that I like about Portland is that it's just a giant neighborhood. So it's like, no, it's not in downtown the, where the big buildings are, yeah. but literally downtown, the city itself is like a giant neighborhood. Mm. So it's in one of those neighborhoods but anyways should be fun because you'll be able to walk down to your uh friendly neighborhood cafe 
Hopefully yeah. you find this on Batch. <laughs> we'll see. I hope so. I'm pretty uh, pumped about it. So uh, All um, I know is I got to get some pips on my birthday. Free donuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are we shooting a podcast in the Airbnb? We can. That's going to be on a that? Friday. We're going to be on the thir- weekend. We're going to be there Thursday. Yeah. We might have the whole... Uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday. I have to bring some multiple mics, have a whole crowd discussion or something. Dude, yeah, we'll yeah, bring, that'd be bring fun. these mag- yeah. mics. So have a little impromptu, impromptu on the, yeah. on the go podcast episode. For sure. um, but yeah, so jumping into the processing. So I think there's a couple things that I think we just need to lay out there mm-hmm. as like a preface to everything um, that hopefully will be a nice foundation for us to build on. And one of those things I think we need to. Uh, lay down is that all coffee goes through fermentation yep every single coffee goes through some stage of fermentation and i like it's impossible yep. to have from it to not have any fermentation so um the, the the reason why i think that's important to lay down is because i think oftentimes we look at naturals and anaerobics mm-hmm. and we say oh uh those coffees are you know just have too much you know they're too they're always so fermenty um or they have too much fermentation or whatever. Well, mm-hmm. the, the reality is it's not the fermentation. The, the fermentation isn't necessarily the problem. Um, it's how they go about to, how how that process goes about to being accomplished right. and done. Yep. So all coffees do go through some form of fermentation. Yeah. On top of that, I think it's very important to note that processing, uh, any, any form of processing, the goal of processing is, is to remove the seed off of the cherry. Yes. That's the primary purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, I think sometimes in, especially our circles, uh, especially within the coffee geeks, the home baristas, um, it's easy to basically find different processing methods and compare those to different flavors or make them equivalent to different flavors, right? Um, Which there is a degree of truth to that. We'll talk about that. But the reality is the reason coffee is being processed is to remove mm-hmm. the seed that is roasted and becomes a coffee bean. But it needs to be removed one way or another. And there's many ways to do that. And those many ways are going to impact flavor. Right, right. I'm, gl- I'm, gl- I'm glad you said that. And depending on, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just said it so well that depending on how that's being removed will actually impact flavor. So there is yeah. some kind of general flavor that comes along with certain processing but i think actually um over time Mm -hmm. uh and over repetitive practice and research and development i think actually develop uh, you know processing across the board whether that's washed anaerobic naturals they've all improved yeah like now washed coffees can taste really really spectacular and now actually naturals right now are probably tasting better than they ever have right before and chances are it's probably going to get even better mm-hmm. further on. Even thinking about like, I have no idea. This is kind of off the cuff. The Ecuador from Manhattan. Oh, it's yeah. like a wash process. It's a but it's a dioxidator. So I don't yeah. even know what that is, but it's a, like a dioxidator washed. That's it's what a, it said on the bag, but I have yeah. no idea what that is. Is exactly. it a form of washed process? It's a form of, I believe, uh, gosh, yeah, I should have done more research, but it's multiple processing methods in one. So yeah. it's multiple wash processes in combination with controlled fermentation. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So stuff like that where, I mean, I think producers all around the globe are yeah. getting so much better at, and it's not that they they were bad at it at some point. It's more that actually, like everything else in the coffee industry, mm-hmm. we're actually still a baby industry mm-hmm. and we're still all learning a lot. Like there's yeah. a lot less scientific facts in the industry then we'd like to actually yeah. admit and right. in reality um all the time there's stuff that's coming out through scientific research that is actually proving us wrong proving things that we thought were right yeah. completely wrong i mean the fact that like the most mind-blowing thing recently was like in roasting where i think um what is it what is it what's his name not simon smirk or is it is that smarky uh, or gosh i we <laughs> mentioned o s m r k e we always yeah. quote the guy and i think we need yeah. to get his name down cuz totally. we always quote him yeah. but 
bad um and then there's also a, a channel called the coffee mine academy which is mm -hmm. really cool it's another scientist studying like taking the scientific research into roasting and they actually both said that hey um well they quoted one another actually and they said that actually um scientifically brazilian coffees have way more as uh, acidity or acids in there than kenyan coffees mm -hmm. which on a blind you know if you were to ask anybody people would actually swap the two and say Kenyan coffees have way more acidity. Mm -hmm. That's not, you know, and so like stuff like That's that, wild. like scientific research that is actually changing um, how we how we see things. So it's, yeah. it's growing. But number one, we're going to start with the main common uh, processing methods and then we'll get into some of the funky experimental mm -hmm. coffees uh, processing that we've seen over the last couple, you know, years get popular. But number one is wash coffees. Mm -hmm. My favorite. I'm just going to say that. My favorite. Cool. It's a classic it's not, I also learned, I guess it's not the first process. Nah. It's actually like, it's, an, a, it's a modern, it's process. a, it's a fairly, it's a kind of a, yeah. kind of a modern process, but not modern for all yeah. of us coffee geeks because it's, we've always, uh, we've, yeah. yeah, everybody's always known about it. Yeah. It's the most uh, mechanical form of processing mm -hmm. because it literally eliminates much of the natural process mm -hmm. of coffee. Yes. Not the, yes processing but you know what i mean it uses a machine to depulp uh the coffee then it uses water to wash it mm -hmm. and a lot of the times for many farmers it actually requires them to find and source water yes. so not every farm is actually privileged enough to be able to do a wash process yeah um, and like you said it's not the oldest method but it is has been the most convenient the easiest method um, to crank out volume, I believe. Right, right. Yeah. Um, With low margin of error, I believe. And I too. think it's worth mentioning that, you know, actually sometimes washed coffees can actually be more costly because of the access to water. And that's such an yeah. important factor to think about. You know, processing isn't just all about flavor, but mm -hmm. there's a bit of accessibility and sustainability and yeah. the, the the ability to do something. And same mm -hmm. with, you know, other fermentations down the line we're going to talk about. Some, for some, it's actually much harder to do um, than others. So, uh, but w let's define some terms. Pulping, depul it goes through a depulper. Yeah. Pretty much just means that it's a de it's a machine, mechanical machine that takes off the, the, the cherry, am I right? Yeah. Off of the seed. Yeah. And that way, after it goes through the machine, it pretty much is left with uh, just the bean, the seed itself seed, yeah. with some mucilage, right? Yeah. And then the, they all, they it also do have, a perfect job. That's yeah. why you still have to wash it. And then I yeah. guess there's also a demucilager. Am I right? So for example, um, the videos that Taylor shared with us, yes. that little machine that we saw that was basically dropping cherries in, it kind of looks, it has a hopper and right. then it kind of has one of those like wheels that are turning. It's like a bunch of gears yeah, stacked gears. on one another that and, the cherries go yeah. through. It's literally almost looks like a grater, but it literally takes um, the cherry and squeezes and kind of pops out the beans. Yeah, pops out the beans. Yeah, yeah. or the seeds. Yeah. yeah. So that that's for future reference for this podcast. That's what a depulper what we're talking about when we're talking about pulping. Um, and then washed is really like a really big umbrella term for saying after it goes through this depulper, um, usually within 24 hours. Uh, yep. It goes through the washing process, which is literally it's washed by water um, and it's, you know, all the, the mucilage and the stuff is washed off of it. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a very simple, basic, uh, pretty much if you, you know, if you were to think like, how do I get a cherry out of a, a seed out of a cherry? It would literally be that you just take out the seed and yeah. you wash it. It's also worth noting that wash process is commonly known as wet processed, mm -hmm. meaning that whether the coffee is like washed by like, okay, let's say moving liquid yeah. or it sits in a pool of liquid, yeah, um, it's wet. That's the goal is that mm -hmm. it's a wet process and then it's either dries or is being cleaned off. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Not so. to be confused with wet hold coffee. Yes. A wet hold coffee is a, com a kind of a different ball game. Yeah. Uh, really popular in like the Asian countries. Yeah, high humidity um, areas. Um, yep. Indonesia and stuff like that. That's kind of a, a, a strange, um, gives you all the flavors that, you know, many of us aren't huge yeah. fans of. And um yeah, but that not to be wet process, not to be con confused with yeah, wet. It's just process. a big umbrella. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. So, uh, other than wash process, not, number two would be um, actually instead of going to honey, let's do natural. Yeah. So number two would be natural. What 
what how what's the natural process yeah. look like as opposed to washed uh, i think the best illustration i can make is if you go into like a classic cherry orchard or a fruit orchard anything mm -hmm. that is just um, that let's say grows on trees right mm -hmm. uh, if that uh if that uh, fruit sits too long what happens to the outside it kind of shrivels up mm -hmm. and then the seed falls out that's the natural process of how things <laughs> yeah. go back right into the earth and then grow another tree right, right. the seed fall uh, the fruit falls off the seed goes back into the ground and grows more plants so natural process is simply that the most raw natural mm -hmm. process of coffee is removing the cherry off of the coffee tree or a coffee bush placing it most likely on a raised bed because yeah. you don't want it to get dirty and it's just chilling out in the sun yeah and it's yeah. drying it's doing its thing and you time it depending on how long you want it to ferment mm -hmm. and then you're cleaning it off and right. how you clean that off that's another there's a dry process where it never touches water it basically gets depulped and cleaned and it still kind of has a sticky residue mm -hmm. a little bit of that quote-unquote honey the mucilage is left but it doesn't touch water sometimes you just take it off when after it's done fermenting on the outside or the cherry is uh, removed then it gets washed again then it gets washed yeah. yeah so so it still kind of goes through a similar process to wash just there's just a stage in between yeah where it, actually the cherry sits on and yeah. i guess from what i read on the dear green coffee buyer book um that sometimes actually they'll sometimes the ferment the natural fermentation actually happens still on the tree which right. is probably Depends a little less popular picked. Um, that's yep, probably for sure. not best practices, but what yeah. do I know about processing? You know, um, so yeah. that's that's natural. Yeah. It literally comes from the name natural, natural. process. Yeah, yeah. oldest, very it's basic. Probably yeah. you know those goats that we <laughs> read about <laughs> oh, God. in Ethiopia. Yeah. They're the probably doing. having some good natural. Some naturals, yeah. yeah. Um, so before we go on, um, what what would be like a difference you'd see in flavor profile between like a wash and a natural? Um, whether that's in Ethiopia, Colombia, Guat, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, the stereotypical, your probably first bonkers experience with a yes. coffee is a natural. Why? Probably because there's Ethiopia. a highlighted, <laughs> yeah, from Ethiopia. Yeah. There's a highlighted uh, kind of berry note and flavor to it um, that it develops. Yep. And that's just due to a different way of fermenting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a, when in contrast to that natural, like a wash coffee may have more of a cleaner cup and more mm -hmm. of a nuanced cup where a natural one can be like punchy and loud and hard. Like it'll just like scream at you and a wash coffee will be, I don't want to say mellow because that's not the right yeah, word. It's not the right it's word. Not, it's not, yeah. it can still be intense. Yeah. It's just a different version of intensity and different it, characteristics. It won't, um, yeah, it won't have as much of that, the booziness almost yeah. that naturals can come with that, you know, that whininess, that, maybe. the whininess yeah. where there's kind of like a little bit of a whiny undertone, which I think mm -hmm. contributes to those blueberry flavors, those, you know, tropical fruit and those big yep. fruity flavors. I think that whininess contributes to that where wash coffees, um, they're going to taste much more cleaner much more like a like a classic coffee really like a yeah. traditional coffee um they're gonna taste a little more you know might be a little bit more delicate have a little bit more nuance and complexity um depends on who you ask yeah. of course and um but really the cool thing is like over the years those two processing methods like especially the natural has improved so much where you're starting to see a little less discrepancy and mm -hmm. saying a natural is going to taste fruity where they've actually seems like producers are changing how they're um, taking on natural fermentation yeah. uh, in a way that might not be super boozy, where now it's a little bit more mellow with some other yeah. flavor, uh, like flavor profile. So yeah. it's not becoming super distinct. And something that I, you know, a coffee that we have right now just gonna is say, really the Burundi Kayanza natural, where it's a natural, but it doesn't have a lot of the same qualities of a classic natural, but it has some of the nicer qualities that we enjoy out of a natural. Yeah. So things are changing, you know? Yeah. And so, um, although you can expect a general flavor profile, don't, don't always let that yeah. fool you. Yeah. It's definitely allowing the farmer to 
I mean, I think what you were saying, not it's not the process itself, but mm-hmm. the time that we've learned about natural process is allowed the farmer to manage that fermentation mm-hmm. on a much better level. And because like yeah. you said, like there's always fermentation happening in coffee, but throughout the course, I think natural has got a very bad rap because they were coming out almost vinegary, yeah, like yeah, fermenty, yeah. like yeah. kombucha style. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people realize like, that's not what we want in coffee. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who, who's to say that it's bad, but it's just not what the general public wants. Right? right. 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 But as time has grown, as farmers are able to manage the fermentation better, they're able to control those flavors mm-hmm. for sure. And I think also, um, yeah. And uh, even through just some things like, you know, extended fermentation, yep. which is like, Hey, now you, you know, you have some naturals that are say si- that are sitting out fermenting for way longer or for a little less, which brings me to the point of, you know, the third process, which is honey, which is kind of a combo of both washed mm-hmm. and, uh, in natural. So the cherry still gets picked. The cherry still goes through a deep pulper, but, the it you um the mucilage from the the seed being inside the cherry is actually left on the coffee yeah. and then it sits out to dry. Yep. And so then you kind of have that natural esque fermentation where it's sitting out, but it's not sitting out um on raised beds inside the cherry. It's outside of the cherry, but it still has some of those insides yeah. stuck to it. Yeah. And with that, there's also three different levels. The amount of mucilage you remove, right. uh, there's yes. like yellow, red, and black. And black having the most mucilage on there. So it's the closest to an actual like classic natural. Right. Um, I think the advantages of honey and Costa Rica made honey process popular. That mm-hmm. They were kind of the pioneers. They of the also process. have like some of the best infrastructure for stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. Kinda, and there's a lot yeah. to that because of water yeah but yeah. um with that said like what the honey process allows for is to be able to basically modulate that flavor from washed into natural but not go too far into natural right, right. so you may still experience like bigger body mm-hmm. coffees like kind of uh the jammier fruit qualities yeah yeah but they're not so intense and they may be a little more nuanced yes, with other yes. flavors mm-hmm. so it's uh, we, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the happy medium because there's not a lot. I haven't tasted a lot of good honey. You know what I mean? Right. Which I don't remember the last time, I, apart from our Odessa is considered yeah. a honey. But you know what I mean? Apart from that one, I haven't experienced many honey coffees. I feel right. like it's kind of underrated, but it's supposed to right. be the happy medium. Right, right. Um, and from, from what I've heard also, honey, depending on the black, red, Mm -hmm. or you know the other honey i keep forgetting what they are um also has to do with how long they're sitting out there because the bean will actually turn from the mucilage it'll turn a different color and that's when people can gauge what what stage of honey it is and although it should be the happy medium the problem is you know if you you know chase after two rabbits you may not get one or the other you know so then then you're left kind of empty-handed with okay it's not a you know beautiful wash it's not a beautiful natural uh, you know it's a little bit of both so um yeah and you're right like uh our you know indonesian coffee that we've already been buying for two years straight is an anaerobic honey processed which Mm -hmm. is a combination of some anaerobic and some you know, honey process totally. in there, yeah. um, which, um, yeah. And I love that you, you know, your flavor profile, what you put in is like kind of a little bit of both with some yeah. fruit. Dried um, fruit. Yeah. yeah. But talking about our Indonesian coffee, now we're getting into some of the funkier uh, anaerobic, aerobic uh, processing terminology and before we go on let's get something straight because i think (laughs) there's a lot of confusion in the industry because we just like headline reading um and you know we think we we know everything please break down anaerobic fermentation and aerobic fermentation and if they even have how do they um let's give a give a small little scientific approach and then give it maybe the cough the coffee industry (laughs) um approach (laughs) um yeah this is the honor i don't want to take um because like i don't want to get shot uh because at the end of the day um there is a lot of debate about this and again i'm no scientist like i only read stuff i listen to stuff i hear scientists talk about stuff and because i have limited knowledge to understand everything um 
I'm going to do my best. With yeah. that said, uh, anaerobic means a classic, like no air. But the reality is all fermentation is based on lack of air, right? So mm-hmm. to say something that is anaerobic uh, fermentation is basically to say like fermentation, fermentation. Right. Um, so it's like redundant. With right. that said, um, also aerobic means with air. So right. that is again, one of those like, wait, how does fermentation happen with air when fermentation usually happens with a lack of air? So it's like, does right. that even make sense? It's like no fermentation, fermentation. Like, it, so it's, right. it's hard to categorize that from scientific. There's so much to dig into it from a science point of view. Yeah. But what does it mean when you see it on the bag is also a good question. Right. Because why do we use those terms? I think right. we're more or less describing the environment the fermentation happens, but right. not the type of fermentation that happens. Right. So, so to get this straight, aerobic you know, the dictionary definition would be with oxygen. Yeah. Anaerobic means without oxygen. Yeah. That's the difference. However, anaerobic, well, fermentation happens without <laughs> oxygen. Yeah. So an anaerobic means without oxygen. So if you put those two together, yeah. it's no oxygen fermentation, no oxygen fermentation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which then leaves you thinking, well, what the heck does that aerobic mean? have anything to do with it now? Yeah. Because can you have no aerobic, which means with oxygen, yeah. and fermentation means without oxygen. So can you have with oxygen, no oxygen, no oxygen fermentation? fermentation. <laughs> yeah. So that's the confusing so part. Confusing. But yeah. really, um, what I'm also understanding now is that the in coffee we've kind of used and abused those terms yes for lack of understanding and you know actually lack of better words to use descriptors yeah. so what anaerobic and aerobic in the coffee industry is actually saying is saying the environment and how we go about to fermenting those things yeah. happens either without air or with air yeah. so what i would assume the coffee industry to call aerobic with air would probably be like an outdoor yeah fermentation or a tank open tank open tank right 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 um in water or whatever so that like outdoor open tank that was what would be an aerobic fermentation in the coffee industry Mm -hmm. and an anaerobic fermentation would mean it's closed off from sealed off and with no oxygen so in other words in coffee that's just to say hey it's outdoors or it's closed off in a closed environment or container but those are not accurate scientifically speaking those terminology don't make sense so there's a there's a line to be drawn there um for you guys who are just trying to understand this just like i'm also trying to understand this it's kind of a little bit confusing to give credit to those terms though the whole purpose of either allowing air or not allowing air is control Mm -hmm. so fermentation Mm -hmm. is happening but how can we manage, manipulate, and control fermentation to get a pleasant cup of coffee? That's right. the big question. So yes, those terms are complicated. Yes, they're loaded. Mm-hmm. But for simplicity's sake, like when we're looking at a coffee bag, what is that communicating? Because then right. we're digging into flavors. Because right. all of a sudden, right. when we see anaerobic, we assume that these are the flavors present. Or when we see washed these are the flavors present right right so i think that's the also the bigger question is this whole marketing aspect when Mm -hmm. anaerobic is on a coffee bag what are we looking for yes yes and there once again i think they're you know for us folks um we're not scientists but they're just ways of communicating which unfortunately excuse me which unfortunately have kind of misled us scientifically but they still communicate the same something so that being said it's really just a means of controlling your fermentation that is happening. Mm-hmm. So anaerobic, give me a rundown. What's going on with the, with these uh, cherries? What's going on in this process? Mm-hmm. Um, again, the simple fact is that it is in a controlled environment with no air, allowing the fermentation to be controlled and manipulated by either the amount of time. Mm-hmm. That's That's a big one. But then the bigger one is the temperature inside the tank Mm -hmm. because you can control that environment. Uh, Imagine that you're for your coffee cherries, you're creating a little world 
Yeah. And you're trying to make that world clean, make that world happy, and you're allowing that little coffee seed to, you know, become a beautiful butterfly. Right. Like right. that's yeah, the yeah. goal. And yeah. when it's sealed off, you're basically giving it that space and that environment to, uh, to do its thing. Yeah. Which from what I'm hearing, then it sh- you know, anaerobic should give you the maximum amount of control over certain variables so that you can really fine tune what you're getting in your end cup, which I think it's kind of on the journey what a lot of producers are getting much better at is experimenting with what's working yeah. best and being able to tailor these micro environments that they're building for this fermentation. Mm-hmm. So um, then there's like anaerobic, but then there's semi anaerobic, which is uh, without air, but not fully without air. There's a degree of air that's present yeah. uh, in the system. So it's not fully locked off, which this could look like, I think if I'm remembering correctly, um, this could look like, you know, a bunch of cherries inside of a, you know, plastic bag Mm -hmm. that have a certain amount of air in there, but there's also cherries fermenting inside the bag. So there's semi-anaerobic where you don't have the ability to block off all oxygen. And then there's anaerobic where all the oxygen is blocked off, Um, which once again also kind of gets confusing and the lines start to kind of merge together because now you're like, well, it could be one or the other. And where do you draw the line with that? Which means, you know, we're not producers. We're not, we're not a scientist. So I I think a lot of that is also super fun, like to hear this. And the more we get into like experimental processes, the things that happen from those can be like completely nuts and can be like a gem like Mm -hmm. we always talk about how much we love diego bermuda's coffee Mm -hmm. basically diego pioneered thermal shock and that's a whole nother thing you know what i mean so it's like to understand different elements and to be able to explore and understand the science behind fermentation Mm -hmm. and then have those elements that you can control right they give bring about opportunity but then again in order for a farmer or producer to have those opportunities there needs to be finances involved there right, and right. the degree, the risk, and the risk is insane. Factor, yeah. So if you only have certain amount of land that can only yield so much crop, it might not be the best thing for a farmer to be like, Hey, I'm just going to run with carbonic right. maceration or right. we'll dive into other experimental processes. Yeah. So we got to consider that when we're also talking about processing is yes. that it could be like high risk, high reward, or it can be a major bust. Yes. And that's recently listening to some producers talk about it is that it's also kind of this anaerobic process also needs the perfect climate for things to work well. So, you know, if, you know, temperatures dip really low or increase really high, you know, you could be fermenting something and then it could just all go to waste. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of risk involved and, you know, in my opinion, which I could be wrong, this is a personal opinion, but... You know, if you mess up a washed coffee, it's just not as great. But if you uh, mess up like a fermented coffee, it's like, well, then you risk just having a coffee that just tastes literally like vinegar, you yeah. know, like that's just really bad. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And most of the, you know, to give some flavor profiles to them, um, a lot of anaerobic coffees are, you know, will be like extreme naturals almost, or at least that's what the industry kind of expects out of them, where they're really fruity, really big and punchy. I mean, Manhattan's anaerobic coffees are just slaps in the face of rich, like you're drinking Kool-Aid or like a fruit punch. Um, It's just bonkers. But that's also not not the same across the board. No, it's not. I mean, there's also, again, to bring up Manhattan, we've just been drinking way too much Manhattan yeah. coffees, thanks to narrative. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, uh, Camilo Torres is, is not really a fruit bomb, but it is a sweet bomb. Yeah. Um, it tastes like marshmallow, like sweet, sweet doughy pastries. Yeah. Like, uh, it's insane yeah. in sweetness level. And again, that that is due to that process. Right. Like, uh, the right. process, again, is able to reveal those uh, characteristics of the coffee. Um, again, to reiterate, it's not creating flavors. Like They didn't create marshmallow flavor by doing that process, right. but they revealed it. So I think a lot of the anaerobic coffees reveal the punchier, heavier, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, would you say that a lot of anaerobic coffees tend to have bigger body 
then maybe down the line. I don't know. Is that a hot t- hot take? It depends on how you look at it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't totally. necessarily say so, yeah. but I can see where that's see, you know where yeah. that's coming from. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I think that uh, also like you know some of our anaerobic naturals like the Marta Ruby, mm-hmm. it's like it's like rich like white chocolate like mm-hmm. vanilla esque with berry and grape. Yeah. Um. It just so nuanced that it's not fruity or punchy, and even though they're not adding those flavors into it, you know the controversial part with this is that has is is the processing getting too much in the way of the natural mm-hmm. organic and that's hard to say organic because it's yeah. like well <laughs> you know yeah. how do how would you even define that yeah. you know the terroir yeah. like yeah. how do you even define that if what's what's normal what's yeah, normal exactly. you know yeah. but at the same time it's like um and that's kind of the difficult part with all these funky fermentations because like how much do you allow the from the processing to impact the flavor of the coffee Mm -hmm. and although they're not injecting marshmallows into the coffee bean yeah but for it wouldn't taste that way if it was processed any other way that's the only way you can really get those flavor profiles so um and really um yeah they yeah there's so much more we could even talk about like maybe on a different episode we could talk about roasting um all those coffees because they all what we've noticed is they all roast kind of uniquely and especially in aerobic coffees you kind of have to take a very interesting approach to them Mm -hmm. um to avoid some you know interesting flavor profiles there (laughs) totally Uh, modulating (laughs) exactly uh yeah this um yeah i think i think this was you know i i had full of a handful of information um we didn't even start talking about experimental stuff right on i mean <laughs> us trying coconut process from nomad literally mm-hmm. like three months ago Jeez. just tastes like coconut juice yeah like literally tastes like you're chewing on coconuts yeah. <laughs> i don't know i don't know i don't know yeah a little dicey um but that being said if you could only drink one coffee for the rest of your life what would it be processing wise um you can you can it would be any origin you don't you don't have to be confined to an origin but let's say you had to drink one process oh man this is a nice little pigeonhole that i'll probably get flack no matter what you say right um i think well here's the thing some of my flavor favorite flavor notes in coffee are cherry that's like on my top list um so i've had coffees that were complete bangers that were naturals and tasted like cherry. Um, but I also had coffees oh, that were washed and tasted like cherries. I'm trying to avoid answering the question. Um, gosh, I, I've teeter-tottered the whole time. Like, um, I was obsessed with naturals, then was obsessed with washed. And now, at this point, like, I'm enjoying a lot of Serge, so give naturals. the people what they want. They want to hear an answer. <laughs> I don't have an answer. It's, it's not that cut and dry. Like, I mean... I, I think majority of the coffees so I've in loved. In a world where you could okay. choose one processing method, you're stuck on like, you're the, I don't know. There's what am I brewing with though? That's a different <laughs> question. <laughs> Does uh, any brew method you want to siphon? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe siphon do better with I wouldn't with want honey. any processing method with the siphon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just carbonic maceration with the siphon. Let's go. Hopefully you as get long as it's Mikava. <laughs> All right. What um, is it? What is it? Give the people what like they want. Today, I'm enjoying naturals. God. Even uh, though this is a washed, fun. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> you gonna leave us there? Friends, you guys already know my answer. I may I may give a different answer. We should come back like a mm-hmm. year from now and do the same podcast all over again. Cause I might give you a different answer. But as of today, I would die with a washed coffee. Mm what they just i went from like i had my like my big enlightenment with like naturals and then that kind of died off and i'm back to washed that's it yeah i i, 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 I just lo- i love yeah. a good solid washed yeah i've also have had just way too many naturals i'm just getting used to them <laughs> and they right, are folks. getting better in the comments down below on YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube and you've made it this far in the podcast, tell us what would you drink if you could only drink one processing method for the rest of your life? Uh, drop it down, DM us, email us, tell us what you would drink. 
Um, but other than that, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. This is kind of an extended episode mm -hmm. um, processing, but it was a, it was a good one. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully this gave you some insight and some good solid information. And also, if you're also still here, share this with somebody who needs a little updater on processing methods. Yeah. Like if somebody's really confused, your buddy just keeps saying something strange. Send him this <laughs> <laughs> podcast yeah. and uh, let this be a good a good resource for y'all. But Thank you so much for watching, friends. Uh, hopefully, you guys enjoy this podcast. But like always, don't forget, reflect what's good.